My name is John Bene Ramsey and I'm having Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In this series, we're going to look at the Khan's Order. And in a nutshell, the Khan's Order was basically the answer to the question, if the Ramsey case went to trial, what would have happened? In the previous series, the John Bonet series, we really looked at the at debunking the uh, intruder theory and this series is going to be basically the opposite it's going to be looking at how a judge found the intruder theory to be valid and that judge was judge Carnes. so when many of us are thinking you know gosh darn it if only this case had gone to trial the Carnes order gives us a glimpse at what could have happened if the case did go to trial and it may not have turned out quite the way perhaps some people would have hoped. So in this series I'm going to take you through the 93 page opinion, the order issued by US District Judge Julie Carnes. The Carnes ruling was based on a civil suit which flowed out of a defamation lawsuit against the Ramses. And this came from Chris Wolfe, who felt that he was being unfairly accused in their book, The Death of Innocence. And what he felt was, he felt that the way that they pointed the finger at him was malicious, meaning the way he saw it, the Ramses knew that he didn't do it because they knew they did it. So that was Wolf's argument and it is quoted very succinctly in the NBC Dateline documentary from 2016 by Charlie Brennan. So if you're interested in the coverage of the Khan's order, it'll be a series of around about 10 episodes. Please subscribe to the channel, uh, like, share, leave a comment. Thank you to the 100 or so who have subscribed since the last video. Right, and let's get started. So, unfortunately for us, and unfortunately for the John Bonet Ramsey case, when I say us, I mean uh, so, some of us on a certain side of the fence. The judge referred to Steve Thomas's work, his book, as basically the other side of the story, basically Chris Wolfe's supporting documents which is essentially that Patsy Ramsey wrote the ransom note at the crime scene and murdered her daughter. So you've got the judge dealing with the evidence against the Ramseys, right? And it is basically framed within Steve Thomas's narrative that Patsy did it, right? And the Ramseys then fought against these accusations and we're going to see what the result was that Judge Julie Carnes found and what she ordered. So according to the order on September 30th, 2002, the defendants, being John and Patsy Ramsey, filed a notice of objection to the plaintiff's statement of material facts. And we're going to really pick it up on page four of the Carnes order dealing with the timeline of the crime and crime scene. Now, What's very interesting as we go through this is the opinion that the judge draws based on the information. And what I'm going to do as we go through it is basically stop every now and then and say, hold on a second, is that necessarily accurate? Has the judge assessed this in a way that is likely, in a way that is reasonable, in a way that is based on the facts? Okay, so this is quoting from the Khan's order, page 4, the timeline of the crime and the crime scene. Sometime on the night of 20, December 25th or the early morning of December 26th, 1996, John Bonet Ramsey was murdered. And this is the first reference to a statement of material facts, right? John Bonet's body was found in the basement of the defendant's home. This is, again, a statement of material fact and the plaintiff's statement of material facts. 
I'm not going to refer to them every single time, but it basically refers to where the plaintiff and the material facts basically agree with one another. I think let's just go into what what they are going to be referred to here. There's the statement of material facts, the plaintiff's statement of material fact, the plaintiff's statement disputing material fact, and then um, the defendant's or the defense, right? So we're going to look at where the plaintiff disputes the material facts as well. I think there should also should also be a TCRSD, which is the true crime rocket science disputing of the facts as they presented here. I would already, almost in the first line, say that it's not sometime on the night of December 25th. It's actually um, sometime in the early morning of December 26th. I think that is a reasonable assumption to make. Um, then the order goes on to note that the defendants have never been charged, arrested or indicted for any offence in connection with the murder of John Bonet and they deny any involvement of her death, although they've been under an umbrella of suspicion from almost the beginning of the murder investigation. Now, if I really want to nitpick in this paragraph, you could spend probably an episode nitpicking the entire first paragraph dealing with the timeline of the crime and the crime scene. First of all, they've got it wrong in the very first five words. As I said, I don't think the crime happened sometime on the night of December 25th. I think that is also interesting that John Bonet's on her grave, it is said that she died on December 25th. I just don't think that is the case. Um, it plays with that narrative that the Ramses all went to bed, slept soundly, you know, just all this perfect, this perfect sort of happy family going to sleep and sleeping peacefully through the night until the next morning only to discover oh wow how did this happen and that is based on the narrative of the opening words of the Khan's order quote sometime on the night of December 25th dot 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 the other thing just to point out is in her opening paragraph here she talks about the defendants have never been charged arrested or indicted incorrect they actually had been indicted not technically, the jury, grand jury had voted to indict them and the district attorney had not signed that. So that would be an asterisk around that word indicted. But what seems like a glowing endorsement, you know, they've never been charged, never been arrested or indicted for any offense in connection with the murder. Well, actually, it's not quite as simple or straightforward as that, as we know. The other thing which is probably going to be a controversial statement to make is I'm not sure whether this really should be a murder investigation. Perhaps it should be a accidental death investigation or the investigation of a cover-up of an accidental death. Maybe that is the proper terminology. But if you're not going to get the terminology right, you're going to get everything else wrong. Anyway, it goes on to point out that on the night of December 25th, 1996, the Ramsey family attended a Christmas party at the home of their friends Fleet and Priscilla White. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred at the party and the Ramsey family appeared happy. Right? And I would not totally agree with th those sentences either. I think something out of the ordinary that did happen at the party was that Burke, I wouldn't say he electrocuted himself, but he did... Um, get a a shock on a electrified boundary fence and it's unclear what the consequences of that were it's unclear whether when he got a shock he caused other children to laugh at him or whether um, he felt humiliated or whether he burst into tears or whether that brought a premature end to the evening it's we just don't know but I, I would call that something out of the ordinary the other thing about the Ramsey family appearing happy, I think in a general sense, maybe that's true. But the last photo of John Bonet is one of the unhappiest photos I think I've seen on her, of her. I dealt with the last photo in the 
last episode, the 50th episode of the John Bonet series. And it is just something that is quite strange is that she looks pale, she isn't smiling, she kind of has a haunted expression about her. I, I, I'm not even sure if I would say she looks pale, there's, there's sort of a yellowness to her skin. And although I drew attention to the um, the hair bow that that was found that was that you can see in the photo, and that can you can see the next uh, morning in her hair. Something that I didn't mention was the green Christmas garland. That's something I've mentioned briefly in some of the narratives, but that is actually something of singular importance that hasn't really been touched on by very many people. You can also counter or challenge this notion of the Ramsey family appearing happy by noting, by referencing the bedwetting that we knew was going on, that the scatological behavior that we know that was going on behind the scenes. But I suppose you could basically nod and say, perhaps in a general sense, they were, they appeared happy. They appeared happy at the Whites. I tend to agree with that. Um, but there's a difference between appearances and reality, isn't there? Then on the drive home from the party, John Bonet and her brother Burke fell asleep in the car. That I think is a, is some is news to me. I'm I'm not sure that I knew that Burke fell asleep in the car as well. Um, in the Doctor Full um, show in 2016, he seemed to know that John Bonet fell asleep, and also he seemed to see her being sort of you know walking upstairs. I think to her bedroom. So I'm not quite sure how Burke fell asleep. I don't know where that comes from. Personally, I don't think that either of those um, facts in that sentence are true. I don't think that John Bonet or her brother slept early that Christmas night, let alone in the car on the way home. And I think there's evidence to show that, and I think there's dynamics that seem to support that as well. The defendants put the children to bed when they returned home and then went to bed soon thereafter. That is something else that a lot of the detectives seem to agree with as well, that the defendants put the children to bed. There was even talk of them being, uh, certainly John Bonneau being read a bedtime story and her mother saying a prayer for her. Uh, when you look at her bedroom, it certainly doesn't look slept in. So we only two paragraphs into the Khan's order and it's starting to irk, isn't it? Anyway, it goes on to say the family planned to rise early the following morning because they were to fly to Charlevoix, Michigan for a family vacation. I think what's missing from that statement is that really what is what they were planning to do was fly to Charlevoix, Michigan for a second Christmas. And so what that implies is that there were other Christmas gifts meant for other Ramsey children that were in the Ramsey home and that might attract the attention of children who aren't in bed yet. Then we go on to page 5. John Bonet and Burke's bedrooms were located on the second floor of the Ramsey home. Now, it then talks about there's also an empty guest bedroom on the second floor located atop the garage. Now, they don't say anything about where John Bonet's bedroom is relative to Burke's bedroom or where Burke's bedroom is relative to the uh, the parents but anyway to answer the question that opposite sides of the house and there is a bedroom closer to Burke's bedroom and the playroom than John Bonet's bedroom so just on that question one's kind of got to wonder why was John Bonet's bedroom not right next to Burke's bedroom surely it would be easier to manage the children you know getting up going to sleep um, getting them dressed everything if their bedrooms are close to each other rather than as far apart from each other than is almost possible on the second floor of the house. There was also an empty guest bedroom on the second floor located atop the garage. The defendant's bedroom was located on the third floor of the Ramsey home in a converted attic space. The home also contained a basement. There were two stairwells leading from the leading from the second floor to the ground floor level. 
The black, the back stairwell led into the kitchen, where there was a butler door that led into the basement. Defendants claimed they were not awakened during the night. A neighbour who lived across the street from the defendant's home, however, reported that she heard a scream during the early morning hours of December 26, 1996. Experiments have demonstrated that the vent from the basement may have amplified the scream so that it could have been heard outside the house but not three stories up in the defendant's bedroom. So I find that very interesting how conveniently you have this explanation that even though the scream happened in the house, someone across the road in another house heard the scream, but someone much, much closer, just a couple of floors above, couldn't hear it. And in the 2016 Dateline documentary, I think one of the Rams investigators said, well, or, or perhaps it was on Dr. Oz, I'm not 100% sure, it may have been Dr. Oz, he explained, well, you wouldn't have heard the sound because there was soundproofing in the house. And this is where you really need to look at the, the house, look at the, bl the, the blueprints, look at in which section of the house the Ramses um, were sleeping and in which section of the house were these f modifications made, right? And part of the Ramsey home was 1920s and was basically a wooden structure. And I can tell you now, sound tends to travel very easily through wood rather than masonry. Also, you can hear the movement of people walking through wood and on wooden staircases much better than people on masonry. Of course, none of this is addressed in the Khan's order either. And so you basically have the judge taking the version of events at face value that, okay, so the defendants went to bed and they woke up the next morning. Okay, so everything there is then, everything that could have happened in between is then glossed over. One thing that I think is worth mentioning is the lights that were on in the house, and this is not in the Khan's order, that were observed by the neighbor, uh, by a neighbor who said that there was a, a light, I think, in the um, northeastern part of the house, which is always on, and on that night it wasn't on. Sorry, I beg your pardon. It's the southeast safety light was off for the first time in memory, and... Apparently also the kitchen light was on at midnight hours. It's uh, unfortunate that we don't have a more uh, accurate time. What does midnight hours mean? In any event, th this is a reference to a report written by Michael R. Yerke. This, this um, report about the lights. Again, this is not mentioned in the Khan's order. So the Khan's order continues uh, about the lower part of page 5. The following morning, defendants assert they woke around 5.30 a.m. and proceeded to get ready for their trip. While Mr. Ramsey took a shower, Mrs. Ramsey put back on the same outfit she had on the night before and reapplied her makeup. Nothing strange about that. Mrs. Ramsey then went down the back stairs towards the second floor, then the spiral stairs to the ground floor, where on a step near the bottom of the stairs, she discovered a handwritten note on three sheets of paper that indicated John Bonnet had been kidnapped. Plaintiff, however, contends that Mrs. Ramsey did not go to sleep the night of December 25th, but instead killed her daughter and spent the rest of the night covering her crime, as evidenced by the fact that she was wearing the same outfit the following morning. Okay, so there is a plaintiff's statement of material facts. He further posits that Mrs. Ramsey authored the ransom note in, attempt, in an attempt to stage a crime scene to make it appear as if an intruder had entered their home. Plaintiff theorizes that, by the way, this is disputed by the, the um, uh, this is something that is disputed. Plaintiff theorizes that at some point in the night, John Bonet woke after wetting her bed and upon hearing of the bedwetting, Mrs. Ramsey grew so angry that an explosive encounter in the child's bedroom occurred, during which tirade Mrs. Ramsey slammed John Bonnet's head against a hard surface, such as the edge of the tub, inflicting a mortal head wound. 
plaintiff has provided no evidence for this particular theory. Then, crime scene photos taken the following morning do not indicate that John Bonnet's bed was wet or suggest that the sheets to the bed had been changed. So this is kind of a, uh, con a counter to that, and it refers to defense exhibits and various attachments. I think the other side to that equation is, what about, does that bed look slept in? Does it look like the little girl was put to bed in a loving way by her parents, given the state of the room? Urine stains, however, were reported to have been found on John Bonnet's underwear and leggings that she was wearing when her body was discovered. Coroner, see coroner's report at 2. Thus, at some point after going to bed, but before being murdered, John Bonnet urinated in her clothing. Again, I'm not sure if I agree with that, that it's before being murdered. It, I don't see why that couldn't be while being murdered or subsequent to being murdered. The evidence does not indicate whether this occurred in her bedroom, the basement, or during the route between the two rooms. This, I think, is a fantastic point, is that there's not clarity where John Bonnet died. Was it in the basement? Was it in her bedroom? Or during the route between the two rooms? I think there are also additional possibilities besides those mentioned there. Then... The plaintiff offers evidence, primarily handwriting analysis, that plaintiff alleges to be evidence that Mrs. Ramsey wrote the ransom note. The above theory is merely speculation by the plaintiff as to what might have motivated Mrs. Ramsey to act so violently towards her daughter. And this brings us to page 7 of the 93-page report. Plaintiff further contends, based again solely on Mr. Thomas's speculation, that's Detective Steve Thomas, that... Mrs. Ramsey thought John Bonnet was dead, but in fact, she was unconscious with her heart still beating. So the contention is that John Bonnet was struck on the struck on the head, or she struck her head, and um, Mrs. Ramsey assumed that John Bonnet died. Right? I think that this is possible, but perhaps it, not Mrs. Ramsey. It could be someone else. Um, actually thought that, some, that John Bonnet was unconscious when she was actually no longer alive. I think that is also a possibility. I'm not going to go into that here. In any event, this, is dis this was disputed by the Ramses, and it's noted there. Mr. Thomas then surmises that, quote, it was that critical moment in which she had to either call for help or find an alternative explanation for her daughter's death. This is also disputed. Plaintiff then speculates that Mrs. Ramsey chose the latter route and spent the remainder of the night staging an elaborate cover-up of the incident. Specifically, plaintiff theorizes that with Mr. Ramsey and Burke still asleep, Mrs. Ramsey moved the body of John Bonnet to the basement, returned upstairs to draft the ran ransom note, then returned to the basement where she could have seen, perhaps by relying solely on the test, uh, th there's something that's missing there, something that I think is redacted. Um, but I'm not going to take it further than that. I do think in this episode, I do think that it is kind of a far-fetched theory to think that Patsy went on kind of a nocturnal adventure all of her own. And when the other Ramses woke up the next morning, they just simply just sort of like plug and play. They just took the cue from Patsy and just played along. I, I, I find that quite a crazy thing to imagine. So in the next episode, we'll deal with the time of death that Steve Thomas gives. And I've got to say, I tend to agree with it. And dealing with the digestion rate of pineapple. And then also, for me, a very frustrating part of the Khan's order is the way that it deals with the handwriting analysis. So if you're interested in that, I'll be back with the next episode in the Khan's order which, as I say, basically supports the intruder narrative. But this is, again, a, a, uh, an example of what could have happened had the John Bonnet case gone to trial in around about 2002. I am covering additional content on the John Bonnet Ramsey case on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash TCRS. And that also includes an audiobook that I'm narrating called The Craven Silence. So if you're interested, if you're enjoying this coverage and you're interested in additional 
deeper dives, deeper analysis, head on to Patre- head on to Patreon. That's patreon.com slash TCRS. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.